On behalf of Mission and Ministry, I want to welcome you to this year's address and thank everyone who contributed to the success of the celebration. A special welcome to our panelists, Sister Ellen DeBrio and Mary Delaney, and the Sisters of Notre Dame and more. And our student respondents, Lori Paul and Maggie Patlin. At this time, I would like to welcome and invite Sister Barbara Gutierrez, Sisters of Notre Dame and more. Good afternoon. As many of you know, we, the Sisters of Notre Dame de Nemours, have an incredible legacy in the letters of century. Julie wrote hundreds of letters during his life, during her life. The sisters in the past preserved the letters and numbered them. So in letter 296, Julie wrote, All I ask to the good God is for you to be busy improving your minds as much as possible. So here we are. And we pray together. Our good God, look with kindness on us as we gather today to talk about ministering to others and bringing your love to those who have been forced to live in disadvantage. Open our minds and help us to understand your message and your teaching, that we may be bold when working for justice. Stretch out our hearts and pour into them such love that we may always be kind and compassionate to friends and to everybody, even those who do not think like us. Prepare our hands that we may have the strength to work tirelessly for education, equality, and justice. Prepare our feet that we may go wherever you call us and that we may leave a path for those who come after us to come. Prepare us to continue to co-create with others and with you, reign of goodness, love, and mercy. We ask all things in the name of Jesus and through the intercession of St. Jude. I am honored to introduce the president of Emmanuel <coughs> College, Sister Janet Eisner of the Sisters of Notre Dame de Namur. <coughs> Thanks to Sister Janet's dynamic leadership over the past three decades, Emmanuel today is providing an outstanding liberal arts and sciences education to a record number of students. Sister Janet's presence embodies the Emmanuel Catholic identity and the founding vision of St. Julie Billiard. As students committed to our faith, this inspires us to live our own lives in the spirit of the mission of the Sisters of Notre Dame de Namur. Sister Janet serves on several boards and committees locally and nationally, including the Board of Trustees of the Catholic University of America. Without further ado, Sister Janet. This is the 21st Founders Day, which is really the centerpiece of our annual Founders Week. And this year, Founders Week celebrates the ministries of the Sisters of Notre Dame, and that, of course, comes from Pope Francis when he declared this year the Jubilee of Mercy, honoring the 50th anniversary of the conclusion of Vatican II. We know that Vatican II had a major impact on the past half century, particularly with respect to the social <laughs> teachings of the Church. Pope Francis notes further that mercy is the beating heart of the gospel, and that mercy demands justice. You will notice this focus on mercy in the whole program of this week, beginning with the liturgies and mission volunteers to competitions for a cause and Zumba. Now the last two raise funds to support the photovoltaic project and Sister Isabel's school in Congo. And by the way, I had a lovely note from Sister Isabel thanking the Emmanuel students for their gifts to her school. Now the mission of Catholic colleges and universities is deeply rooted in the mission and ministry of the church. In fact, this is the 25th anniversary of Ex Corde Ecclesia, which means from the heart of the church. And that's the document that has led Catholic colleges and universities in this country to articulate more clearly the founding vision and mission 
awe and charism of their founders. Catholic colleges are seen as an extension of the service of the church and particularly in the promotion of social justice. We notice that in our own mission statement, don't we? Excorde calls us to examine the roots and causes of the critical social issues of our time, in particular, the challenges that relate to the protection of nature. Now you may recall that this topic is addressed so eloquently by Pope Francis Laudato Si, and you may remember that we discussed this right at the beginning of this semester in our convocation address. Um, that was a great address, and we had wonderful conversations back in September. But it didn't just stop there, because so often this link of service and the church's social teachings comes across and is very much a part of the classes that students engage in, particularly in programs in religious studies and theology and in many others, and very much a part as well as the work of our mission and ministry team. So today I have the privilege to introduce two amazing women who live to the nth degree the mission of the Sisters of Notre Dame, making known God's goodness, educating for life. And both of these women evidence this not only in our very local community, our local church, but also in many ways in the global church. So today I'm delighted to introduce first Sister Ellen Davido. And Sister Ellen was some time ago missioned to Brazil for 12 years, where she provided education and support for poor families and communities. Now you may recall both from earlier Founders Weeks, that another sister of Notre Dame, Sister Dorothy Stang, was martyred for taking a stance with the poor Brazilian farming families in their struggle against the ranches and agribusiness. If you remember also, we showed a number of film, pic, films, and if you look carefully, you may have remembered when you see Sister Ellen that she was very vocal and visible in those films supporting Sister Dorothy. So when she returned from Brazil, Sister Ellen worked for the Archdiocese of Boston, assisting the Portuguese-speaking communities in Stoughton and then Peabody. Now she serves as a support coordinator for the Northeast region of the Sisters of Notre Dame in this country and continues to accompany the Brazilian community in Peabody. So Sister Ellen, with great joy, we ask you to share your reflections. This moment. I'm happy to introduce and welcome Sister Maria Delaney, who's recently completed 12 years as a member of the Sisters of Notre Dame Congregational Leadership Team. So she's been based in Rome for the last 12 years, but she has spent most of her time visiting the five continents where the Sisters of Notre Dame minister. So she's had an opportunity for frequent visits around the world. And she may not say it all now, but you'll have a great conversation afterwards as she tells you about some of that. She is an educator and has taught in the, and administrated several high schools. She was the first executive director of the Notre Dame Education Center in South Boston, where many of our students volunteer. In fact, in 1997, Emanuel College conferred an honorary degree on Sister Maria uh, for the work that she did as the first um, executive director of um, NDEC. Um, she's now the co-director of the SND Office of Sponsored Ministries. So welcome. Most of us know Sister Dorothy because she was assassinated. But Sister Dorothy spent over 40 years in Brazil being merciful. Not only to the poor farming families, but praying for a turnaround of ranchers and their business owners turn their hearts away from greed and to the suffering of the people that took their land from. That is to be merciful to both sides of that. I hope to talk a little bit about that today. So when you think of Dorothy, the life-giving, merciful presence among those families. So this is a year of mercy, says Pope Paul, says Pope Francis, and we are to be, and we are called we are called to mercy. Maria and I were given three questions. So I would like to address each one of those. 
The first was, in what ways do you reveal the mercy of God through your ministry? At the moment, I am involved in two ministries, quite different and similar to one another. One of them, as Sister Janet mentioned, I am present to the Sisters of Notre Dame, my other sisters, in the congregation, as what we are calling support coordinator. Those two words speak for themselves. I have been doing this ministry for just about a year and a half. This means that I am there for the sisters. I am present to them and with them when needed. I visit them in their ministries, schools, hospitals, education centers, and when they are sick. I am present to them with a listening ear when they're trying to figure out things. Is it time to move? Is it time to retire? Time to give up my license. And so I am present to them. I am called to be available to them. In the other ministry, which I have been doing for over 35 years since I returned from Brazil, I am present to and with the Brazilian community in various cities and parishes north of Boston. In the first ministry, when I tell people what I do, they say, oh, that must be lovely. The sisters are always so nice. To help the sisters to listen to them, that must be such a wonderful work. It must be so consoling to you to know that you can be with them. Right. They're right. It is a wonderful ministry, and I love it. I love it. And then I have this other ministry that I do. And then when people hear that I work with Brazilians, often I hear, really? Work with immigrants? Tell me they have papers. I suppose they're undocumented. You know, they're taking jobs away from Americans. You must know that they're criminals, aren't you scared? They work under the table. I'm sure they don't pay taxes. And they want everything for free. They should be deported. You shouldn't really be helping them. In our very ancient Catholic tradition, we have what we call the seven corporal works of mercy. They are, and all of us are called to this, feed the hungry, give drink to the thirsty, clothe the naked, shelter the homeless, visit the imprisoned, visit the sick, and bury the dead. Have you heard of those? <coughs> They've been around a long time, right? They're actually named within the Catholic tradition the <coughs> corporal works of mercy. In responding to the needs of these two very different communities, the sisters and the Brazilians, it is a call every day to be merciful and compassionate. The sisters need a vital presence, someone to be fully present to them. And I love doing this work. <coughs> the immigrant community needs the same. They desire the same. 
And trust me, they need people to be with them, practicing, putting in practice the seven corporal works of mercy. I would define them this way. Finding apartments for them to rent. Whenever there is a new immigrant community in a city, people are like, really? I don't really want to rent to them. They're probably not going to pay their rent. And they don't have papers. Am I going to get in trouble? Finding, finding apartments for them to rent. Winter clothes for families who never in their lifetime imagined the cold of a New England winter. Impossible to imagine. Whoa! Oh, yeah. Many of you come from the Southern Hemisphere, you know what I'm talking about. It's not possible to imagine. Translating in schools, hospitals, doctors' offices, how to bury their dead in a foreign country. How to help them manage sending their dead home. Dropping it off at the airport. Looking on the Homeland Security site for those picked up by immigration to see what prison they're in. Consoling their family when either the mom or the dad was picked up and they didn't come home from work. And they don't know where they are. Find them. Visits to prisons for those picked up by Homeland Security. That got harder and harder. It gets harder and harder to visit a prison. I love working with the sisters. I love working with this immigrant community. The Brazilian community is loving and caring of one another. Loving and caring of me. There's a lot of work to be done with the immigrant community. I love it. Second question, that was only the first one. <laughs> what sustains you? What sustains me in both of these ministries, with the sisters and with the Brazilians, is the deep gratitude both express for the littlest thing. A phone call. Gee, I heard that. Showing up. Being present. Saying, yes, I can. Yes, I can. The deepest gratitude that they express. With the Brazilians, I am very animated. I love going to their liturgies because they have incredible faith. They live in very hard times. They live very precarious lives. They will say to me, God, you know, when I go out in the morning and kiss my wife goodbye and put my kids with the babysitter, I don't know if I'll see them at night. That's precarious living. Their deep, deep faith. What is a challenge for me 
in this world. Therein is to have mercy on those who have created what has been created in our country. Continues to be created. It's not new, it's been here for a long time. Where the new community, the new immigrant community are criminals and rapists and thieves. Those who use the media, social media, to create fear and hate in the rest of us. Suspicion. My mercy prayer, somebody up here who said about forgiveness. <laughs> My mercy prayer, which is a challenge for me. My mercy prayer is that God will give them, those who create this narrative, will give them the grace to turn, we're coming to land, right? To turn away from this vision. Repentance, forgiveness is about turning. It's about making an adjustment so that I'm seeing something. We removed the flowers, do you know why? We couldn't see them. If we can't see them, they don't exist. So, to, that they will turn, so that they get another view. They get another view, and they keep turning. So the view becomes completely different. That's, that's what I, my prayer is. The challenge to pray that prayer. So that they will have a new vision. That God, in God's great goodness, will give them a new vision, an open heart, and the courage to change. That, that's what sustains me and challenges me. The last question. Where in, <laughs> I read this question differently the first time. I will read it, how I answered it, and then I'll read it how I read it. <laughs> I laughed out loud after I realized what I had done. Where in our world do you see the most need for mercy? When I read it the first time, I said, where in the world do you see the most mercy? <laughs> I went, whoops, I don't think that's I think that the greatest need for mercy is in ourselves. In his new book, The Name of God is Mercy, Pope Francis says, mercy is the first attribute of God. The name of God is mercy, he says. There are no there are no situations we cannot get out of. We are not condemned to think into quicksand. When I read that, I said, where I feel sometimes that I'm stuck in quicksand, in the light of everything that's going on in our world. We need a new global consciousness that allows us to see suffering humanity as a result of global sin. We need to look at the pictures of masses of people being forced from their homes, out of their countries, separated from their families, and all they know about life and how to live it. We need to look at that and weep. We need to ask ourselves, what is happening? There is clearly wrongdoing here. But what in ourselves needs attention? To right the wrong. To help get out of the quicksand. As a human family, the growing consciousness is about the human family, we need to hear God calling us to return, return, who we really are, to the depths of goodness God meant us to be. Remember when God created the world, he went, you know, the myth story of our creation myth story, 
always reverberates with one refrain. It was good. Good. And it was good. So we turn to the goodness that was meant to be from the beginning. You need a new human, worldwide consciousness. And its name is Mercy. Sister Janet mentioned that I received an honorary degree here, but I want to say also, I also received my bachelor's and my master's degree from here. So Emmanuel is very part, an integral part of my educational formation in my DNA. It was a blessing for me to have had the opportunity to travel on five continents visiting our sisters. It was both a humbling and a sobering experience. We work in very poor areas of our planet and I've seen both abject poverty and the tremendous efforts being made by individual countries to better the quality of life for their populations. I've seen the effects of war, usually civil war, on people, and these effects are multi-dimensional. In addition to the outward demolition of the infrastructure in the country, there is a deep-seated anger and desire for revenge that become part of the DNA of the survivors. Irelin spoke of the corporal works of mercy, and I'm going to weave my brief reflections around the lesser known, but equally important, spiritual works of mercy which are also seven in number. These transcend religions, and these first four I see lived out every day. Counsel the doubtful, instruct the ignorant, admonish sinners, and comfort the afflicted. These first four all speak to noble professions that people might aspire to as teachers, counselors, pastoral workers, healthcare professionals, social workers, and the noblest of all professions, parents. They summon us to reach out to our neighbors and to relate to them in ways that will enhance their well-being. There are also services that we often provide for our friends. People who do this type of outreach are often lauded for their work. In the Gospel, we meet many people who place blame on people who are suffering and berate them for bringing this on themselves. These merciful actions let people know that we will walk beside them non-judgmentally. Before I mention the last three works of mercy, I would like to speak about what each of us can do to promote the practice of justice in our world. Like Sister Ellen, I see the greatest need of mercy within each one of us. We can look at the atrocious acts committed by people who are trying to remake the world according to their own personal worldview. But we miss the fact that mercy requires individuals to be peacemakers, not peace breakers. This is not an easy task. Attacking evil in our everyday lives is a reflex action. We don't even realize that our knee-jerk impulses, even rash judgments, can sometimes be construed as violent by someone else. Mercy requires an attitudinal change and the courage not to condemn. Shakespeare's words, it is an attribute to God himself, and earthly power doth then show likest gods when mercy seizeth justice. The climate surrounding Pope Francis, who has brought these merciful actions into the forefront of our consciousness, is often hostile to his radical ways of thinking. In many ways, he incarnates for us on earth Jesus, who was often in trouble and angered many people with his insistence that the most vulnerable people in society were the ones who needed the most attention. Jesus practiced
practice of mercy was not universally accepted, and neither is Pope Francis's. His call to behave mercifully toward others rattles many people. Neither will our attempts at mercy be universally accepted. I'm setting the stage for the next two spiritual works of mercy, which are revolutionary. Forgive offenses, bear wrongs patiently. I'm now going to be using the words of a journalist who works in Rome, has worked in Rome for about 25 years, and who covers the Vatican. Pope Francis is prophetically disseminating a message that if we actually heed it, could easily unsettle and change our lives in ways far more radical and destabilizing than anything unleashed by Islamic State militants. Mercy is a far more dangerous weapon than terrorist bombs. That's because the practice of mercy requires that we forgive those who have hurt us, even in horrible ways. It means we pardon them rather than demand, according to human justice, that they restore exactly what they have destroyed, even if that is more or less, and more often than not, impossible. Mercy and forgiveness are the exact opposite of retaliation, vindication, or even retribution. Calling us to be merciful, just as Jesus says we must not judge, but must turn the other cheek and love our enemies, goes against our innate sense of justice and fairness. True that those who have harmed us, who have broken the law, must be held accountable for their wrongdoing. But without mercy, forgiveness, and reconciliation, there can be no healing for either the victim or the perpetrator. South Africa was aware of this when they were healing from apartheid. And they took that into consideration during all of their trials. By refusing to show mercy and pardon to those who attacked or abused us, we, whether as a nation, an institution, a particular group, or a single individual, can too easily end up clinging to our wounds with pride and a false sense of righteousness. The only way to heal these wrongdoings is by letting go of them. Pope Francis's call for a greater mercy in the world and in our lives is not some fuzzy, sentimentalist attempt to cover over faults or sweep wrongs under the carpet. Rather, it is a challenging, yes, even threatening message that will upend our lives if we truly embrace mercy and offer it to others great intuition of Pope Francis. It does not threaten some aspect of our life, no matter if we identify as a traditionalist, a progressive, or anything in between, then we probably aren't listening. How can we be agents of mercy in the world? By incorporating these corporal and spiritual works into our consciousness, and risking ridicule and de derision when we live them out. The final spiritual work of mercy is pray for the living and the dead. As Tennyson has said, more things are wrought by prayer than this world dreams of. Our prayers become part of a ribbon of prayer that encircles the planet at every moment as people of all religious persuasions send their thoughts and deeds into a realm far beyond their own self-interests. Years ago, the Washington, D.C. police asked people to pray during a terrible crime wave. 
crime abated. You are integral part of Emmanuel, God with us. We ask you to go forth in peace, love, and mercy. I just want to thank you too for sharing your stories and your ministry. Um, as student panelists, we have two questions as well to reflect on. Um, what, the first question being, what sister um, ministries have you participated in, and how was how has that experience shaped, inspired, or challenged you? I've had the opportunity of tutoring and being a teacher's assistant at the Notre Dame Education. I met Sister Delaney and spoken to you um, during our lunch break, so it's great to see you again. Um, I'm just really honored to be in the presence of amazing sisters um, who've really contributed to helping so many women um, remind me so much of my, uh, my mom and my parents. Um, so with answering that question, um, I've been volunteering at Notre Dame Education Center since uh, February of 2015, and um, as I mentioned, just helping students with areas of writing, reading, uh, literature, math, um, and there's different uh, services that the Education Center offers, and I helped with um, the ESOL program, as well as with the uh, high, school high school equivalency program and the adult basic education program. Um, those departments I truly thank for my time serving as a tutor and then also as a teacher's uh, assistant during the summer through uh, Emmanuel's Summer Fellowship, which I think you all should apply to. Um, of course, like, you all can, but I think that <laughs> you all should still apply. Uh, that's one of the greatest things that I've done at Emmanuel. Um, that's really shaped my time. Um, at Emmanuel, just working at the Notre Dame Education Center. Um, it's inspired me, I would say, in various ways, one of which being um, just working with the adults, mostly it's mostly adults um, that uh, attend the Notre Dame Education Center, and these students are very passionate. Um, they are very eager to learn. Uh, most of them are immigrants, so uh, their stories are amazing. The fact that they can balance so many things and still have the passion that they have for education and um, just using, I think that it's been able to also shape me because I would like to go in the field of education and being a school psychologist. Um, currently, grad school responses, so that's nerve wracking. But um, knowing my calling, and I know that I want to with empowering people um, in that field was definitely a great experience for me to just learn from the sisters that are there. Um, they definitely create a loving environment. I think, I definitely know, because statistics also show that um, the environment that is created within schools definitely impact the students, and you can see that um, with the students and speaking to them and using um, my language skills to speak to their a lot of Haitian American um, students there, and just being able to use that those skills um, was really, really great. Uh, it challenged me as well because uh, I constantly hear the quote, change starts at home, and I, I don't think I realized that until I realized that I helped a lot of students there, and they always gave me great compliments. Um, but then when I went back home, it, it kind of was a shock to me with talking to my mom about my experience at NDEC and realizing that I haven't been helping her as much because my parents, um, I came here when I was four, like uh, they never had a college degree and she would always, coming from a big family and helping my younger siblings um, with different like writing letters to my younger siblings' sisters and I would just be very impatient um, because I was private high school so I had a lot of homework so I would just brush it off um, and I realized that I wasn't taking the skills that I do to others at home. So being merciful um, in that way, I think definitely it challenged me. Um, and then I'll let Maggie go on to the second question. Hey everybody. 
Um, I would also like to thank you, Sister Ellen and Sister Delaney, for being here today. Um, I was privileged enough to work at the Julie Center for um, Family Learning. Um, I also worked with Sister Louise and Sister Julie, and they are two of the most wonderful women I've ever met, along with the other faculty. Um, I was also shaped, challenged, and inspired this summer through the fellowship program that I did with um, Lori, which is a lot of fun. You guys all should apply. Um, so, um, I would work with young mothers every day. Um, I would go in every day not necessarily knowing what tasks I would be put up to, whether it was cooking in the morning for all the faculty, or tutoring the mothers, or being sent down to the Montessori school to work with their children. Um, I realized that the big barrier um, for young women who have children is education. I mean, these women are juggling their kids and jobs and trying to find homes for themselves to like provide a stable lifestyle. And the fact that they had such a drive to um, finish their high school education was um, very inspiring to me, especially because I grew up with such a he heavy emphasis on education. Um, I really learned the ins and outs of what it truly takes to run a nonprofit every day. Um, I continue to serve every weekend, um, pretty much every weekend throughout my college career, but every day, just the nitty gritty, whether it's sorting, sorting trash bags of donations to cleaning to, you know, doing, helping with donations upstairs, um, it's quite the experience, I would say. Um, these young mothers, I would say, inspired me. I can only think of this one instance. Um, this woman named Julie, she had an autistic son along with a two-year-old, and she was sad, and she revealed to me that um, it was the one-year anniversary of her daughter's death, and she died when she was one. And my heart broke for her because this woman, I had given her my fellowship tea pass because she didn't have money to get home to the homeless shelter she was going one day. So, you know, um, I later learned from the other mothers that it was also her birthday that day, which was horrible. So, me being me, I jumped up and I went to the store and I got ingredients to make a cake and candles and a card for all the faculty to sign. And um, at the end of the day, we presented her with a cake and along with her two sons that we brought from the school. And the tears of joy, she was, was just amazing. And she um, revealed that she, that was actually the first time that um, anyone had ever made her a cake or sang her happy birthday on her birthday, and that was her 23rd birthday. Here I am, like, fighting back tears, making an excuse to go get more forks out of the kitchen. I was just, like, completely blown away. I ended up calling my mom that day, like, burst into tears, like, thanking her for all she's done for me, because I have never not had a birthday party or with my family and loved ones around me. And so that moment, along with so many other moments, just really, as much as these women are in need of direction, they showed me a lot of direction in my life and my passion to like continue to help people, and um, especially when it comes to education, to break the cycle of poverty, for sure. We also were asked to reflect on the question of um, how does mercy look like to you, and how do you live it out in your daily life? Um, this question was definitely more challenging for me, at least to um, reflect on. I agree with everything the sisters were saying. I believe that mercy is um, a gift, and I also believe that it is definitely God's grace and his love and his forgiveness, and I wanted to share um, quickly some scripture that I think really demonstrates that. There's so many verses in the Bible that show this, but this was a two sentence verse, so nice and short. <laughs> Psalm 30 verses seven through eight. Lord, in your kindness, you made my mountain safe, but when you turned away, I was frightened. I called to you, Lord, and you, and you asked you to have mercy on me. I like this verse because um, it, it shows that uh, we constantly need to show mercy, and because God does that for us, and the, the relationship I think that comes with um, the person who is giving mercy and also receiving it, um, I strongly believe that it's easier to um, or give to receive mercy than to give it. 
Um, so in my reflections on how I, I live it out, of being a person who's like giving mercy is definitely very challenging, but I try and um, live it out by, um, as my daily, with my daily work of being um, an advocator and educator for social justice in the American education system, um, more specifically so uh, looking into the a systematic racism um, within our education system. And I know with my work um, within the President's Commission and then also being on different student leadership groups like Black Student Union, doing, creating different workshops um, that try and um, raise awareness about these issues and then educate people just due to the various uh, backgrounds we all know that we've learned from history um, that's impacted our education system to be the way that it is. I think it's it's a challenge for me every day to, to show mercy as I'm doing that, but I also believe, um, and I believe this, one of the, uh, I think it's or Ellen who also mentioned this, um, in the process of reconciliation, I believe like that mercy, love, and the willingness to change from those receiving it is needed when um, trying to rebuild um, a community. So that's the way that I try and give mercy. Um, this question was also a difficult one for me because there are examples I could share or you know thoughts out in my head I can share, but. Um, I would always, you know, Sister Louise, she'd always thank, you, thank me every day for being there. And I would be like, don't thank me, this is what I'm here to do. And just the compassion she would show people, as long as Sister Jean, um, she more worked with the children, and she, you have to show a lot of compassion when, with it, when working with children. But um, even when the young mothers would not, like, maybe show up for their lessons because they had work or couldn't make it, you know, they're, they're always deserving of a second chance in her mind and her eyes. So. Even um, all, even throughout my years of service, um, the people who choose to make nonprofits and soup kitchens their daily life, I think show the most mercy because they, they aren't there because um, obviously it's they're like a well-paying job. They're there because it's like they're calling and they're helping people, and they really realize the impact that they're having on each individual life, even if when it's just one person passing, getting a you know, a, a, a meal that day. Um, you know, I don't think mercy is necessarily seeking rewards. I think mercy goes to the people who are maybe the most undeserving. Um, I mean, second chances are just so important, especially when working with um, first generation immigrants and people who are getting their degree for the, for the first time throughout their family. Um, I'm, in, I'm currently enrolled in Catholic Social Teaching. It's my first religion course here at Manual, and um, I'll be serving at Mission Grammar. And we are reading a book by Gregory Boyle, and he um, gave a TED Talk, and one of his quotes really stuck out to me. Um, it says, he says, the measure of our compassion lies not in our service of those in the margins, but our willingness to see ourselves in kinship with them. So throughout my experiences, um, I can really almost place myself in someone else's shoes because um, you know, no one wakes up every day saying, I want to be homeless. And it's not, sometimes they've made choices throughout their life, but they really strive to like make themselves better and make their daily um, challenges just and deal with them. So I think mercy is shown in my daily life through the compassion that other people show um, to these people who need help and also um, in change how they as much as like you know, young mothers I work with, as much as they might need direction in my life, they showed me the direction where I should go in my life um, as far as my passion for social justice. So it really is a two-way street, I feel like. We now have a short time for questions. Uh, Laura and Maggie, did you have any questions you want to begin with? Um, I have a question for both of you. With uh, the theme of being mercy, how do you recharge yourself so that you can constantly give mercy? Because sometimes I feel like I have a mercy burnout, and <laughs> and it's just very hard sometimes to continually um, give mercy, especially in the work that you're doing and uh, just the work that both of you are doing. Um, so I was interested in knowing any advice that you would give, um, steps that you take to recharge yourself 
so that you can continue with skills. I think sometimes we just have to stop and come to terms with the reality that I am really not the Messiah here. There was only one and his name was Jesus and it wasn't Alan. And um, even though I sometimes think I am and I can do it and I can fix it, and I just, I, no, I can't say no to this. Um, one time uh, when I was really like you know, dragging myself around, a Brazilian, her name is Mira Alene, she stopped me one day and she said, you know, um, some of this stuff you're running around doing, we can really do ourselves. So we have to stop sometimes and say, well, why am I doing it? Am I doing it for myself? So I think that we have to recognize the signs. I'm saying this because I was in a period where I didn't recognize the signs, so I know what I'm talking about. We have to recognize the signs um, when we really are tired, when we really are getting mad too often, when we really don't believe what you people are just talking about. People really do deserve a second chance. And we say, no, they don't. So that when we stop, we have to stop for the right reason. We can't just stop because we're tired of talking to that person, or I've given you too many chances, and I'm not going to give you another one, or what did I tell you the last time? No. We have to stop because we kn I know, I have to stop, because I know that I'm no longer useful in this. And I am creating something else. And it's not empowering. But, you know, once people, this is my thing now, you know, going to the doctors. Once people really can't figure that piece out and how to answer the questions, I don't really need to be there. Some things are hard to let go of if you speak another language. You know, it's really nice to be shown up if you speak another language. I love it. Yeah. You call it a translator and interpreter. It's a pretty nice word. So you have to know when to stop and recharge your battery. Does anyone else? For um, my ministries down through the years, uh, the glue that has kept me together, and I recognize it as glue, is uh, my prayer, my meditation time, which I never miss. For me, it's early in the morning. And I never miss it because I would be afraid to, <laughs> because I know I would just be a total scatterbrain, and I have too many uh, things happening around me to become, it's very important that I remain centered, and that's the only way I have remained centered. I attribute that to prayer. And now they're teaching meditation in colleges to corporate executives and everything. So that's extremely important. But the other thing that uh, Sister Ellen mentioned is presence. Sometimes in the midst of all of these things that are happening around you, the most you can contribute is your presence. Because if you are present to somebody, they know that there's at least a, a support system nearby. If they need help, they'll ask for it. But very often, people will come to their own answers, but they just need to know that they are not alone. So a lot of times you don't have to do anything, you just have to be. And that's something you learn, sometimes the hard way. Sister Ellen, you said, um, you know, you said something about having the courage to not condemn. And, um, you know, we are in today's world, we're faced with so many negative labels and stigmas that can be put on race, religion, gender, and all those things. And I really think that, um, you know, for someone who doesn't come from a background of religion or have a lot of grace when handling this, sometimes it can be hard to like reach out to those and who maybe they don't think is, are deserving. So um, my question to you is um, how, what are the, multi-dimensional effects of those who would reach out um, and how can someone who is intimidated by maybe doing service, how can those people in their own little ways reach out to those um, to overcome those barriers of stigmas and um, enlighten themselves? I think one of the way, remember the flowers, the flowers of the table. I think one of the best ways is to um, meet someone 
seen another person. I have a, I have a, I had a brother, and he has since died. But I had a brother who used to say to me when we first started um, working with the Brazilians, he had a, a pickup truck that I would sometimes borrow, and he would say, "I just know there's going to be an undocumented immigrant in that truck." I just know it. And then I never answered. You know, I just went with the truck and. We did have our undocumented immigrants in the truck and everything else. He never said no to me. He just kind of like asked. Then he needed something. He needed something done in his house. So I got a hold of my two undoc one of my you know, two of my undocumented immigrants, if you like to call them, and I said, you know, would you go? Go and tell my brother want to do something. Sure. So off they went, and they did what. He needed to have done. He fell in love with them. He said, God, those guys are so nice. Those guys are great. Now, he's not a Catholic. My brother, he belonged to another religion, and he, another, Catholic, another Christian church. And he said to me, do they go to your church? And I said, yes, they do. He said, well, I'm really glad to know that. And he never moved to the next question, which I know was inside him. I know it was inside him. And he didn't want to know it because he wanted to like them. And maybe if he really knew, he would have liked them. And he had no more reason. He had no more reason. Because they were fully responsive to a need that he had, and they did it, and they didn't ask him any questions. So I think you get over it. You get, we get over our fears. All of us have fears. All of us have fears. Yeah, I lived in Brazil for so many years. I was used to Brazil. I could speak Portuguese. I could walk in. But trust me, when I went to Nigeria, I was scared. Such unknown, un, a completely unknown territory. I didn't know how to manage customs. I know how to manage customs, but I didn't know it here. So the willingness to do it and to admit and when we are in a place doing this, what you're asking, how do we get over it? It's like going to a place where you don't know the language, you don't know anything. It's scary. We don't know the language of poor people either. What they share today is the language of poor people. You know, the, the, the number of jobs. So, it, so to learn another language sometimes is just to be with people who are not like us. That's how we do it. We just do it one person at a time. Remember the flower. <laughs> well, that's unfortunately all the time we have for questions. Um, but another round of applause for our panelists. <laughs> we will now have a musical reflection uh, led by Greg Paré and the student singers. I invite you to join us in singing. Come now, font of every blessing found on the back of your program. <laughs>
thank you. Thank you to everyone who contributed to make this 24th Annual Founders Week address a success. Thank you to Sister Janet for introducing the theme for today's address and for situating our discussion in the context of higher education. Thank you to Lori Paul and Megan Patton for sharing your experiences as well as the wisdom from their experiences. Thank you to our guest panelists today, Sister Ellen Gabriel and Sister Maria Delaney, who shared about how they have answered the call to mercy through their various ministries. We have a special token of our appreciation for you. introduce Father John Spencer, Vice President of Mission and Ministry, to offer our closing prayer. Good afternoon, everyone. I, this has been a very interesting session. I'm, I'm really glad we did it. It's... <laughs> Think for a moment of what we have heard this afternoon from Sisters Ellen and Maria and Sister Janet. They have so graciously shared their vision and experiences with us experiences wrapped in a seasoned wisdom and faith. They have seen much in their lives. They have seen suffering as well as joy. They have truly seen the corporal works of mercy and the spiritual works of mercy. And their vision is global and worldwide. And think for a moment about the experiences of Lauren and Margaret. They are of another generation and their experiences not quite as tender as Ellen <laughs> and Maria, are nonetheless filled with a nascent wisdom and rooted in the spirit of Notre Dame, a magnanimity of heart, hearts as wide as the world. In their service sites, Margaret and Laurie witness to the works of mercy and thereby proclaim the good news of Christ. Dear Lord, we are grateful today to be part of this enterprise at the crossroads of generations, the young and the mature. <laughs> the beginning and the ongoing, the meeting and embrace of God's goodness. For in the words of Hopkins, the Jesuit poet, the just man justices keeps grace that keeps all his goings graces. Dear Lord, continue to bless and keep the generations of women and men who have been blessed to live the vision of St. Julie. May we be committed to maintain her spirit and flesh the corporate works of mercy and be the faces of Emmanuel, God with us. Amen. Amen. Finally, I'd like to invite uh, For Good Measure to lead us in the alma mater. Why don't we all stand and sing with them? Amen.